Every once in a while, you run into a problem that seems really easy to solve, but then you look at the internet to see who solved it, and the solutions are atrocious. They vary from being expensive to just not working, or my favorite, a combination of the two, charging you money for something that doesn't work. And sometimes the problem is so simple, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. One of those problems is something I run into probably more than most people. I often have an SVG, usually a logo from like a company or a framework or something I am discussing, that I need to have as a PNG. Because despite my graphics editor for photos and thumbnails supporting SVGs, most things like video editors don't. And I got so annoyed that I built not just one tool, but two. I know how simple this problem should be, so the tools that I created are both free and open source, but I still have some bills to pay, so let's hear a quick word from our sponsor. Bolt.new, and I'm gonna do something a little different with today's sponsor. I'm not gonna show you how it works. I'm gonna actually show you it not working. So I was streaming a few days ago, and I wanted to use Bolt.new to create a game of tic-tac-toe really quick, and it gave this answer, which, I mean, technically speaking, it is correct, but like, no one wants to play tic-tac-toe this way. It detected the winner right, but what went wrong here? In most tools like this, you can prompt again in order to ask it like, hey, can you fix this for me? But that doesn't always work and sometimes it actually makes the code even more confusing. What Bolt does differently is it actually gives you the code, not just like the source code to use in your project, but you can edit it directly. So when I hopped in here, I saw, oh, this is mixing a flex call. It's just flex, obviously it's gonna be in a row. So I added flex call here, command S for save, and it worked. That's all it took. And it's just like the way you would edit in your own IDE and even kept the state. You get the full control you would expect because it's by the people who made stack blitz. You can't see the little button here, but that says open in stack blitz. You can just click it and open it there. And even better, you can deploy with one click too. I could say deploy it and it will automatically deploy directly on Netlify. And look at that. You just get a link to a deployed version. And now I have my own tic-tac-toe game on the web. Can't be that for prototype in Kenya. Thank you, StackBlitz, for sponsoring today's video. Go give Bolt.new a shot. First, I want to complain. When you search for an SVG to PNG tool, you'll find a few options. This one is free, and it seems totally fine. Let's upload a random SVG. First thing is it is not only letting me upload SVGs. It's letting me upload anything. I can upload a zip. I can upload a folder. I can upload all these things, which is annoying when you're trying to find the SVG in the folder that you want to use. So I will use the upload thing wordmark. That took a bit longer than I would have liked, but now it is here and I can click download all, which puts it in a zip file and gives me the one image at the exact same resolution that the SVG claimed, which if your SVG is claiming a large resolution, because it's a vector file, cool. But if it's not like, for example, the stack blitz logo, which is hard to find because it lets me upload anything. This one is going to download as like two kilobytes and it's tiny. And you zoom in, you're like, oh, that's blurry as hell. There is literally no way using this tool to tell it, hey, since a SVG is a scalable vector, how about you scale it up a little bit? Because why would you ever need to do that? I don't know. Why would you have a fucking SVG in the... I, I cannot believe they don't offer scaling. Meanwhile, they offer something much crazier that we had to try because converting from an SVG to a PNG makes a lot of sense because an SVG is a vector. The PNG is just a representation of that vector in pixels, but you can't really go the other way. Usually when people convert PNGs to SVGs, like they're using some tool like Figma, what it's doing is it's embedding the PNG as a base 64 encoded data flag inside of the SVG. So you're not actually getting a vector. You can't turn pixels into a vector. You have to draw a vector on top of pixels by hand usually to make sure you get it right. But here, I wanted to show you guys this because it was very, very funny. Here's a PNG of my face. And we can download the SVG for it. And obviously, if we go through and look at the code here, we can go find that base 64, right? Huh? Eh? Yeah? I should have recorded my initial reaction because I did not know what was gonna happen here. So I opened it in Affinity. It actually tried its best to make individual curves for every single thing it saw in terms of colors. And the result is this weird watercolor pastel looking bullshit of my face because it tried to recreate it 
programmatically turning the chunks of colors into vectors. It's a cool, like, weird art style thing. But I hate it. Don't convert PNGs to SVGs. If you're looking for a tool that does that, your understanding of both SVGs and PNGs is fundamentally wrong. Fix that. Don't do this. So that was tool number one. The one I found myself using a lot was this guy, the cloud convert. Note, cloud convert, which means this runs in the cloud, which means it costs them money. So when I click select file and I click my SVG, if I find also, by the way, still doesn't let me filter for just SVGs. Let's grab the stack blitz one again, because that was the one that was the good example of being too small. I can go convert and it'll do the same thing. But more importantly, I can go to settings and I can set a much higher width. So we'll set that to like a thousand. Doesn't show me any other info here, but at least I can make the width bigger. Then click convert. Wait. Hit download. Click. And if I open in preview, you can actually see, look at that, actually somewhat high res now. But if you do this two more times, they're going to say, you can't do that anymore. You have to pay us. And you have to buy a subscription for conversions. <sighs> what if I told you, you can do this all in the browser with like 30 to 40 lines of code. Here's a service I made, quickpick.t3.gg. I have two tools right now, but what we're talking about right now is SVG to PNG converter. Oh, look at that. Upload SVG. Look at that. I can only click SVGs. How revolutionary. I go and click on the Stack Blitz logo. It tells me the original resolution and it tells me what the scaled resolution output will be. 117 pixels wide is not enough and 24 pixels tall is actually fucking useless. So I'll click 32X. 768 tall sounds about right. Save. Now I get a saved file that is the correct resolution and it updates the name to say what multiplier you used. Insane, right? So hard to build. I know I need custom scale options. Believe it or not, I only had custom initially, but we're going to add it. It doesn't take much time, but it's also open source. So you can just go to GitHub and file a PR if you want to. Look at that, we already have one. Someone removed my leftover console logs. Thank you for doing that because I had a lot of debugging issues and now those will be removed. Thank you. Cool. I'll be honest. I don't know how much I intend to maintain this service. I wanted to solve the problem that I had and now the problem is solved and I am happy. I want to show off the code a little bit before I show off the second tool because I am proud of it. It is really useful. Hop over to the square image square tool. By the way, I could, I had this all just in the page component but I couldn't do metadata because it was a client component. So my options were move metadata to its own file, metadata TS. I, actually, I don't know if that ended up shipping. I know it was being considered at a time. Or I could make this a server component again and just move all the client logic to a separate file, which is what I ended up doing. So here is Square Tool, the actual fun logic here. I need to import React. I don't even know why that's there. That, that got auto-completed from fucking cursor. Oh, this is the Square Tool. That's why. I barely wrote the square tool. I'll be honest, most of that code was generated. I did write the SVG tool though. This was a bitch. So the SVG tool has the metadata. Wait, no, this should be, oh, I guess that's because it was in the page before. So that doesn't need to be there anymore. Cool, already making fixes as we go through it. And I wrote this wonderful scale SVG function. It takes in the SVG content as a string. I create a DOM parser. I parse the SVG content from this string and create an SVG doc element. I grab the element off of it. I then grab the attributes for width and height because that's how you know how wide and tall it is. I scale them with the scale multiplier and then I set the updated properties and then I serialize the results. So this is how I actually do the SVG scaling to make the correct resolution of SVG. And then I have my SVG converter hook, which takes in the canvas ref, SVG content, a scale, a file name, because you can't get that from the SVG, because the SVG is just a string of the content from the file. You don't know the file name anymore. And then the image metadata, because actually, I don't even need this anymore, because we're just using image metadata for all that. Look at that. Code review live for a video. Scale SVG is scale SVG. And this is all memoized because I don't want this rerunning all the time. I am running React Compiler on this project, so I probably don't even need to write this use memo, but I did it before I thought, oh, I can just use the compiler. We have the width, which is the scaled version, the height, that's the scaled version, the scaled SVG, which is what we generated here. 
And those are now the values I can use, which I pass back in order to render them in the canvas. I then have my convert function, which grabs that canvas ref. It throws if you don't actually have the canvas. And then I generate my save image function, which it will convert the canvas's current value to a data URL, which is a PNG. I then create it as an element on the page as an A tag, set the data URL to that, so that now you could theoretically click this to save, but that sucks to do. So I just click it for you, <laughs> which is, believe it or not, the only way to trigger a download from the browser. There's no download API. There are just links that trigger a download that you can trigger the click for. <laughs> Welcome to browser standards. Then I create the image. And then once the image loads, I draw it to the canvas and then I call my save image function. And what is the source for that image that has to load? Right here. Data image SVG XML, encoded URI component for my scaled SVG. But the fun catch that I learned relatively quickly <laughs> is that if I don't render the canvas properly relative to the SVG I'm putting in it, everything falls apart. So in this hook, where I have save as PNG button, which is the button for saving. It takes in the SVG content, the scale you have selected, as well as the image metadata. The important detail here is once I call my use SVG converter hook, I have my canvas here, which has the ref as well as the canvas props. Also note that I'm not using a traditional ref. I'm using use state here because when I used it as a ref, I had stale references fucking everywhere. And rather than fixing that, I did this instead. <laughs> it works. I have my little plausible call here. So on save, I can log the fact that someone saved, which is cool because now if I go to plausible, which is my go-to anonymous analytics provider, which funny enough went down right after I did this, <laughs> we can see on quick pick that I've already gotten a thousand people going to it in the less than what, like 12 ish hours it's been around for. And we can even see down here how many people have done conversion so far, 207 total. That's exciting. But that is just the first tool. The actual core part here is not that complex or even that interesting. I just have the file uploader hook that I wrote that just keeps track of the current file. It does a little bit of parsing, get metadata. And then you have an input on change, handle file upload. It only accepts SVG. This is the one line of code those other tools were missing, by the way. Just on the input, accept equals dot SVG. It's not that hard. Yeah, <laughs> you get the idea. So let's go to my other tool. Because my other tool is admittedly even more niche, but for me, it's even more useful. Square image generator. Why would I want my images to be a perfect square? If they're not already a square, why do I care? I'll show you why. Let's go to programmer humor. Programmer humor is a great source for me to get free memes to post on Twitter, or more importantly for me, on YouTube community posts. So if I save this image, it Cool. The blurring on the sides there was happening on Reddit. So the way Reddit makes content fit properly is they do some blurring around it so that it fits a square. The way YouTube communities do it, if I go and make a community post to show you, is that it just crops it. I can choose where the crop happens. So I can take just the top or the bottom, but I can't use the whole image for the preview, which means that you have to click into it if you want to see the actual content of what I post on YouTube communities. As per always, I'm engineering around someone else's incompetence. In this case, I'm engineering around YouTube's. Admittedly, YouTube doesn't have a huge group of hundreds of thousands of normies making posts on YouTube communities. So there aren't a whole lot of people who care. I'm in the unique group of people who care and can solve the problem. So I built the square image generator where you take an image that is not a square, and now it is a square. You can choose if the remaining background should be white or black. And then you hit save. And now when I go to YouTube and I hit the image upload button and I put my squared version, you get the whole thing now. Whoa. <laughs> How is this not a thing? What's funny is there was a tool, I'll admit, square and image is a thing I've used a whole bunch. And I'll show you the workflow here. Choose an image. Choose the image. It does this awful blur hash that literally never, ever works. You can increase or decrease the radius and it is garbage. I scroll down. I check square with color where it defaults to red. Why would I ever want it to be red? 
If someone has an answer for why, let me know, because I have no fucking idea why I would ever pick red other than because red is the border color you choose when you're debugging. So I bet this is what he put in to make sure it was working and just left it there. So we'll change this to a different color, either by using the picker to find the color we want around the edges or use this joy. Cool. And then scroll back down and hit download. What? <laughs> what? It's just, it's too much. And to be fair, shout out to the person who made this for making it because I did use this for every community post I have made pretty much ever, but it was like three times more clicks than it needed to be. Somebody said the reason for this being red might be chroma key. No, because it is trans, you would use transparent. You're saving a PNG, who cares? No, you have an alpha channel. There's no reason for it to be red. And there's also no reason for it to be the worst blur hash in the background instead. And my favorite thing, if you're doing multiple, first off, I appear to have just broken the page. But if you're doing multiple, there's no way for me to do a different one. In order to switch images, like if I pick the wrong image, I have to refresh. That's the only option. The revolution I've introduced to the world with my square image generator is by default, the background will be white, which is correct. Black is one click if you want it. Save is one click without scrolling. And you can cancel if you want something else. The only flaw, as Chad has been very quick to point out, is that we are missing red. So the best we can be is two out of 10. Oh, real talk though. If you're a fellow YouTuber, this is going to be very... The, the number of YouTubers who have already hit me up saying, holy shit, how has nobody made this right before? Thank you so much. Yeah. Now you've seen the square image generator. Now you've seen the SVG to PNG tool. None of these require the cloud. I can turn Wi-Fi off on my computer and it will still work exactly the same. There are things remaining I want here. I want drag and drop. It'd be cool to have more options. And a bulk processor would be really nice too. People were asking for like Favicon asset generator stuff, which could be really nice. All fun things to add, we'll get there. I think that the native input supports drop, which is cool. So I can take this and drop it. No, it doesn't because it's a label. I can fix that, whatever. We'll, we'll fix those things. But the thing I want you all to take home from this video isn't that my tools are great and everyone else's suck. It's actually something a bit more, I guess personal is the word, but hopefully something more useful. Being a developer isn't that unique. I know that because millions of y'all watch my videos. There are so many developers around the world, most of which can make most things. Pretty much everyone watching this video is capable not only of using and understanding the tool I built here, y'all could have built this yourself. And I'm not the one who built it, because I'm some god dev who figured it out first, or some product visionary that understands what people need better than anyone else. I built this for a very simple reason. I needed it. Everyone has unique needs based on the things that they do, both inside of coding and outside of it. And if I'm gonna emphasize anything in this video, it's that. You have something in your life that is not optimal right now that a piece of software could make easier. It might be software that you know how to write. It might be software you don't know how to write. What I'm telling you here is it doesn't matter, do it. These projects are what keep me going. And the amount of tools I use every day that are things like this that others created is unbelievable. And some of the most successful things I have built have been for me wanting something so badly that I built it for my own use case and then it blew up almost immediately afterwards. Things like upload thing, things like pick thing, which is doing way better than I expected. Things like quick pick, which I just released. Things like all the cool stuff I did at Twitch, all the things I did at the other companies I worked at, ping.gg itself. But the biggest one is here, this channel. This channel exists because I wanted to nerd out about crazy tech stuff in a senior plus conversational way. I made this channel because no one else had done it. And if you make the things that you want to exist and you make them so good that you genuinely enjoy them, you will almost certainly eventually find a lot of success with that. In the absolute worst case, you have a great thing to nerd out about in your next interview. So yeah. Go build solutions to your problems. And if you want to fix quick pick, we're open for PRs. The GitHub link's at the bottom. Go make something that you actually want to use. Until next time, keep nerding out.